will carry out the panel with the participation of Professor Gary Bourne, Professor Catherine Rogers, and Mr. Jonathan Hamilton, to whom we especially thank for joining us today. Having said that, Lucia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joaquin. Good afternoon to our distinguished guests, professors, colleagues, and scholars. We are honored to have you here to celebrate the 77th issue of our law review, Themis. My name is Lucia Lopez Gallardo. I am the current editor-in-chief of Temis. Before I begin introducing our work, I would like to thank all of you for joining us. Also, I would like to express our team's gratitude to our editorial coordinators, Professor Jose Daniel Amado and Mr. Martin Doe, our editorial advisor, Mr. Fabio Nunez del Prado, the authors, peer reviewers, and sponsors. Without your efforts, none of this would have been possible. Temis has established itself as one of the most distinguished law-oriented publishers in Latin America. We are a Peruvian legal journal established in 1965 and run by law students of the Pontifical Catholic University of Peru. Our publications include work from the most distinguished authors in our field. We pride ourselves on presenting the most up-to-date information in each of our publications. The 77th issue of Temis Law Review marks a record-breaking amount of published articles, totaling at 34. This issue is also our longest, sitting at approximately 500 pages. This is an important milestone, which allows us to look back at our beginnings. Almost 55 years ago, our first issue was published as a small 32-page magazine. This growth is a testament to the success of our mission. We seek to disseminate legal culture not only in Peru, but globally. Each issue represents one step towards that goal. A little over a year ago, we, the editors, had to ask ourselves, what should our next issue's topic be? Since every issue of our law review takes on a specific field of law. After all this time, I can say we took the right decision when choosing arbitration for this number. Nowadays, disputes mainly arise between states, investors, and multinational corporations, transcending national frontiers and becoming an inherently global topic. That is precisely what this issue of Temis reflects, internationalization. This has been a journey, to say the least, I can remember the moment we sent out the invitations to celebrate the author's work. As I sit here now, seeing our product come to fruition, I feel a sense of pride inexpressible through words. This is the materialization of sleepless nights and late Zoom meetings. It is the culmination of knowledge and most importantly, the representation of our bonds and dedication to our craft. We have learned a lot along the way. Here at Temis, we say, innovar es nuestra tradición, translated to innovation is our tradition. As the world continues to defy limitations and roadblocks, I know Temis will continue to adapt and meet the changing times. Law is more important now than ever, especially as our world becomes more interconnected. We, as lawyers, are interpreters. And as such, we must ensure that our understanding also transcends the context in which we live. We hope to do that with our work. Thank you all again for being here and for being part of our Temis journey. As always, innovar es nuestra tradición. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia, for those words. Our next speaker is Professor Jose Daniel Amado, one of our editorial coordinators, to whom we specially thank for all his effort in making this event come true. He will introduce the latest issue of our law review, and later he will moderate the panel with professors Bourne, Rogers, and Mr. Hamilton. Professor Amal, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much, and, and good afternoon, uh, good evening, good night, depending on where you are. Uh, this is a, uh, a great opportunity uh, for me, and, and I really uh, have to give my special thanks to the editorial committee of uh, Temis uh, for uh, making me participate in this very important project, uh, putting together the 
uh, an issue uh, which is uh, coincident with its 55th anniversary as a law review uh, managed by the students of the Catholic University of Peru. Uh, and, and to make it about arbitration, uh, which is uh, such a subject matter of my teachings also and my writings. Uh, it is uh, also a, a tremendous honor to, to, to you know, give, give you a, a general overview of, the, of, the, of this special edition on arbitration, uh, Temis number 77. And then it will be even a great, greater honor or an equal honor to be moderating a very, uh, you know, world-class panel, uh, including Professor Gary Bourne, Professor Catherine Rogers, and Mr. Jonathan Hamilton. So uh, I'll, I'll first do what I've been requested to do, which is uh, just uh, explain to you what this issue is all about. Uh, the index is something that, that everybody can have access to, I mean, it's uh, in Spanish and, and in English. I must say that uh, as a former editor of FEMIS, uh, you know, the, my first reaction when I saw this issue is really uh, one of uh, humbleness. I mean, this is clearly not the review that I used to work on. This is much more uh, a world-class product. And I congratulate the current editorial board because of uh, that achievement. Uh, when one goes through the various articles in this uh, this um, special edition, uh, you get to a number of conclusions. First of all, this could be a law journal anywhere in the world, uh, not specifically to Peru. In fact, more than 55, 60% of the articles could very well be published anywhere in the world. Uh, they're not uh, specifically addressed to the Peruvian audience. Uh, even more so, four of the articles, and by the way, we're talking about 30 articles on arbitration, four of the articles are, uh, have been written and are being published in English, which is uh, something that is quite uh, impressive also and, and shows a lot about uh, the degree of attention that Temis is uh, gaining throughout the years. Um, so. Clearly, I, I will not be, uh, I'm, I'm taking zero credit for, for what, what I'm just explaining to you. Uh, Martin Doe and myself were asked to be something like a, a, title, a, very, a very nice title of coordinators or co-coordinators. But frankly, uh, all what we, that we have done is to provide advice, we are available to the students, we run the, 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 the law review. Uh, also to give them some advice about this event, the launch event, uh, and basically being available to them and give them our ideas uh, uh, on how to structure the, the review, the law review, and, uh, and those type of advisory work. Any of the merits that you will find in this publication uh, are the are really the hard work of the current editorial board of FEMIS. Uh, this group of students that are making us, me as a former member of the editorial board and a Peruvian, extremely proud. Uh, going, in, going into the, into the index of, of number 77, of course I will not go article by article, it's impossible and, and frankly uh, we have a panel uh, that is uh, something that most probably you in the audience are waiting for. But let me just say that the way this, the, 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 this, specific, this special edition is, uh, is structured is uh, we have, uh, they have six uh, sections, let's say, uh, dealing with the special, different matters uh, of arbitration. Uh, there is one, uh, dealing with the arbitration agreement, uh, first one. The second one is dealing, deals with uh, arbitration uh, proceedings. Uh, the third one uh, de deals mostly with uh, deliberation and arbitral awards. Uh, 
the fourth section deals with case management. Uh, the fifth section, uh, which by the way has seven articles, it's uh, pretty amazing. It deals with investment arbitration. Um, and, the, and the last section on arbitration deals with uh, current challenges to arbitration. So, uh, frankly, we're talking about uh, some of the most uh, cutting edge issues uh, that, that, that could be present in, in any type of law publication on arbitration. Let me just very quickly uh, mention a few of the articles that caught my, my eye and I have read through uh, many of them in the last two, three days uh, again in the, in the final format. Uh, there is a, a wonderful article by Roque Caivano and Natalia Ceballos uh, uh, on the principle of competence, competence, and, uh, and the, re the relationship that they make some sort of comparison between the, the most current uh, International Commercial Arbitration Act of Argentina, I mean, which was enacted only a year ago, approximately, and, uh, and to some extent with other jurisdictions, including Peru. Roque and Natalia are extremely well known in Latin America, particularly because of uh, the fact that they are involved in the mood arbitration competition that is uh, yearly run by uh, the University of Buenos Aires and, and the Universidad del Rosario in Colombia. Uh, there are some other articles uh, in that section. Uh, there is an article by uh, Gil Cuniberti and Manuel José Segovia. Uh, they are uh, in the Legal Academia. One of them is a professor of law at the University of Luxembourg. Um, uh, and there's, there's another article uh, by J Professor Genevieve Somier, uh, very well known pro Canadian professor at the University of, of, of McGill in Quebec. Uh, the two uh, last articles that I just mentioned are written and published in English, uh, which uh, t tells us a lot about uh, globalization in the academic world. Um, on the, current, on, the, on the matter of arbitra arbitral procedures or, or arbitration proceedings, uh, there are a lot of, lots of articles. Uh, I've been reading uh, a couple of them. Uh, one is uh, written by Magor Sata Jutkiewicz, who is a Polish attorney uh, and also a Peruvian lawyer now. Uh, uh, Magor Sata or Gosha is uh, part of the legal uh, um, staff uh, of, of the Catholic University. And I really enjoyed her, her work on uh, the civil liability of arbitrators uh, that is uh, published in, the, in this issue. Uh, I should also say that there is an article by Dean Cecilia O'Neill of the Universidad del Pacifico in Lima, together with uh, Melissa Del Pino. A, it is a very interesting piece uh, on uh, arbitration and uh, legitimate third parties in the challenge of corporate resolutions. Uh, and and th there's another article that I want, would like to mention by uh, one of the leading practitioners here in Peru, Mario Rellardo and, and one of his colleagues, Alvaro Cuba, on uh, anti-suit injunctions in Peruvian arbitration. I think this is uh, probably the, a first timer and I think it's going it's, it's to be of great interest to uh, both uh, academic and, practitioner, uh, and practitioners uh, in the arbitration community. Uh, in the issue of deliberation and arbitral awards, again, lots of great articles. Um, I was reading and really I, w I got a um, uh, very, very... Uh, uh, very much into this article written by Fernando Barquemeyer or uh, on dissenting opinions. Quite an issue. I really, really, really like it. Uh, like the, the way Fernando presents the question of the importance of dissenting opinion and basically dissents on the majority view that dissenting opinions are of no use. 
So uh, I uh, encourage you to, re to read that article. Of course, there are other great articles. Uh, I could uh, stop uh, in any section. For instance, in the Gates Management section, there's an article written by two uh, members of the Freshfields um, Harris office, uh, Giselle Stephens uh, Chu and Camille Tenier. Uh, and it's on the contribution of the Prague rules. It's a uh, controversial, but rather interesting development in the last few years. Uh, and they do a great job in terms of presenting that uh, to the general audience. Uh, the article is written in English as well. Uh, there is also on investment arbitration, if we go to investment arbitration section, there are a number of great articles. I really, uh, uh, I personally enjoyed uh, the one written by uh, one of the Latin Americans, very, very well-known arbitrators, uh, Eloy and Sola, uh, on double nationality of individuals uh, in Venezuelan investment arbitration. Really an, a very interesting uh, piece of work. Um, I found other very interesting articles. Uh, one, one by Andres Talavera deals with a case in which I had the honor of participating, uh, Berkwick v. Peru. Uh, there's another one by Andres Alvarez Calderon that deals with uh, uh, arbitration and corruption in investment arbitration. Um, and then on the challenges, uh, there's one that I like to I would like to promote. Uh, it's, I think, mandatory reading for all of us who are interested in, 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 in the issue of gender equality, gender equality in arbitral tribunals by Tatiana Herrada, a Peruvian scholar. So, um, of course, you know, it is impossible <laughs> that I go through all the, the articles and my apologies for those uh, authors that haven't been mentioned. Uh, I encourage people to take a look at the index to really get, get a little sense of what we're talking about here. It is absolutely a uh, um, must-have type of publication. Uh, and I really, really have enjoyed reading all the articles, including the ones that I haven't mentioned. Uh, and once again, I congratulate uh, the editorial board of PEMIS for, for the, their efforts in putting together such a Tremendous, uh, tremendously important volume, which, by the way, is uh, in excess of 100, 100 pages. I mean, that will give you an idea of what we're talking about. Uh, so anyway, that's uh, in terms of the, our guest of honor, which is the, the, <laughs> the number 77 of edition of, of Temis. But we have uh, other guests of, of honor. And really, uh, it is a great privilege for, for me uh, to introduce uh, 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 such a distinguished panel. Uh, and, and the panel will be dealing with uh, issues related to uh, a, big, a title, which is called, the title that the editorial board chose is A Chance for Regulation, the Arbitrator's Role in commercial arbitration. So uh, may I first, uh, may, may I, I'll just say a few words about uh, our guests because they need no introduction. But uh, let me just say about uh, Gary Bourne that uh, he is, as all of us know, the, the author of, of probably the most important uh, legal treaties in international commercial arbitration, which I I happen to see to have here behind me. Uh, I know that there's a new edition that is forthcoming. Uh, we're looking forward to it. Um, Gary is not only uh, uh, you know very well known in the academia, but he is also as one of one journalist once once said, and nobody had uh, anything to say against it. Um, for many of us, he's the best advocate in the world, and and. And, uh, and Gary uh, is, as such, the chair of one of the world-class uh, international arbitration practices. Uh, he, he's the global chair of international arbitration at Wilmer, Kadler, Pickering, Hale and Dorr. 
uh, working out of London, basically. But not only that, Gary is also the chair of the Singapore International Arbitration Court, which is uh, by far the uh, arbitral institution uh, has been um, uh, the fastest growing arbitral institution in the last uh, few years. Um, that's, uh, um, that would be enough to say, uh, to introduce Gary, uh, and of course I have lots of things that I would, I, could, I would be able to say. May I just say that Gary is also my friend, and I'm extremely proud of that. <laughs> Talking about friends and friend of, friends of the Peruvian arbitration community, we have also Catherine Rogers. Um, Catherine, um, everybody, uh, I believe, knows her, but let me just say that she holds two uh, very important positions. Um, one, as you know, as uh, tenure, tenure professor at uh, Penn State University, uh, uh, and, and she is also a uh, part-time professor at, at Queen Mary, University, uh, which is part of the London University system. Uh, Catherine is very well known because of many uh, issues related to ethics and the legal profession. And most recently, in the last few, year, few years, uh, for her work with respect to that specific issue, uh, uh, ethics and the legal profession, but as it relates to arbitration. And we'll get into that when, when, when we are... Uh, when we, when we, uh, talk to her. Uh, last but not least, let me introduce also somebody who needs no introduction, Jonathan Hamilton. Jonathan is the head of Latin American arbitration for White and Case, another very distinguished practice. Uh, and he's um, a very good friend of Peru. I mean, he has been a Peru's Peruvian counsel in many successful cases. Uh, the last uh, decade or so, maybe, maybe a little more. Uh, uh, he will provide the Latin American uh, perspective to everything we're going to be discussing here uh, through this conversation. Let me just say that, that uh, for those of you who, who will be seeing Jonathan for the first time, that he, uh, he was the lawyer who represented Peru in the case against uh, Yale University. Uh, dealing with the recovery of the artifacts that were in possession of Yale University at uh, the time, um, um, as a result, sorry, of the fact that Yale University had sponsored the, the, the rediscovery of uh, Machu Picchu. So, uh, you know, that uh, shows how close uh, Jonathan is to uh, to the legal community in Peru and, and to the Republic of Peru. So I'm, I'm very happy to have three good friends. I, I must have said before that uh, Jonathan is again, also a very good friend of mine. So uh, this is gonna be a very interesting conversation. We hope that, uh, that you, you will enjoy it, enjoy it uh, 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 as much as possible. Uh, I've, I've been told that, that it, you will be able to make questions to a Q&A um, device here. So let's see if we have time because you know, it's, uh, we're running against the clock here. But we'll, we'll try to make some time for at least a couple of questions if possible. So without any further introduction, uh, may I uh, uh, address directly Gary Bourne? Um, and basically uh, tell him you know, about perhaps a question that will allow us to, be, to have, have an overview of, of, of the issue. Uh, Gary, as you know, in the last few years, there has been uh, uh, people who have written that um, corruption is a significant problem, a uh, significant threat for arbitration. Uh, so I, w I wonder what would be your, your views on that, uh, first. And second, uh, what if, if that, if, if you would agree, uh, at least in part, with that uh, problem, uh, what could arbitral institutions do to uh, cope with this, uh, with this uh, uh, problem again? Gary? That, that's a great, a great question. And before I, before I try and 
answer it as, as best I can. Let me um, begin by, by thanking Tamas for the very kind introduction. It's an honor, pleasure to, to be here um, this evening with, with you all. Let me also thank Martin Doe and Professor Amado, um, also good friends, um, for, for their part in, in inviting me here. Perhaps most importantly, though, let me thank all of, all of you, all of the attendees. It's Friday night, at least it's Friday night here. I, I may not have anything to do, but I'm sure that all of you have other things to do, and I appreciate your, your taking time out of your, your Friday night to, to listen to us. I think the question um, of corruption, corruption in international dispute resolution is an important one, a, a fundamentally important one. If, if justice is, is corrupted, whether through bribery or, or other types of undue influence, it perverts in a very literal fashion the course of justice. It's something both we in the arbitration community and everyone, um, every lawyer, every, every citizen should be concerned, fun, fundamentally concerned about. I would though hesitate to start in thinking about corruption with arbitration, international arbitration. Instead, I would think about judicial corruption, which I think is a much greater, much more serious, much more pervasive threat to international dispute resolution, domestic dispute resolution for that matter. If you haven't read it, if you haven't recently read it, it's well worth looking at Transparency International's 2007 global study on judicial corruption. It's worth looking at it, but it's deeply disturbing in some senses. The reports that they provide about corruption in domestic legal systems all around the world, whether Latin America, other parts of the Americas, Asia, Europe even, um, are stunning. The frequency with which participants in civil litigations in national courts are requested to make bribes or aware of bribes being paid to judges is stunning. It's on the same order of police and, and corruption, police corruption and corruption in construction and, and similar projects. In one Southwest Asian country, 96% of all litigants in domestic court proceedings reported that they had been approached to pay a bribe. In Russia, just to pick one country, perhaps unfairly, because other countries are no different, in 2007, more than $200 million in identifiable bribes were paid. I don't think the past dozen years since 2007 have made judicial corruption go away or frankly get any better. It's gotten, at least so far as newspaper reports suggest, and Transparency International subsequent reports indicate it's gotten worse, perhaps materially worse. And I think in a sense, we miss the bigger picture when we focus only on financial bribery as a type of corruption. In some countries, European Union, for example, a different type of corruption of dispute resolution, international dispute resolution has been studied as been seriously proposed. By that, I mean the European Investment Court, which violates the most basic principle of judicial fairness, the notion that no man, no woman should be a judge in her own cause. And yet the European Investment Court would replace a process by which both parties in international disputes participate equally on a level playing field and selection of a tribunal with one where the tribunal is entirely chosen by one side. That may not be corruption in the sense that Transparency International studied it, but in a more fundamental sense, it is corrupt. 
And it's something that when history looks back at the record of dispute resolution in our time, we'll judge harshly, we'll judge very harshly. It will echo of the star chamber where one side chooses all the decision makers in a dispute with another. Arbitration, of course, also faces the threat of corruption. But I can say in 30 plus years of international arbitration, I have never seen an arbitrator sitting on a, on a tribunal with me or before whom I've appeared tainted by corruption. I've seen arbitrators who've been predisposed, who've in a sense descended to the role of advocate. But so far as I have seen, never have I witnessed corruption, nor at any institution that I've been involved in have I seen corruption. Does that mean we shouldn't undertake efforts through greater transparency, greater disclosures to ensure that no suspicion of corruption or something like it exists? No, of course we should. And our arbitral institutions should work hard at that to dispel the charges that sometimes get leveled at institutions. Often those though, those charges are, if I can put it that way, this way, smoke screens for attacks on the arbitral process itself. I think this is, corruption is a fundamentally important question, but where it really detracts from international dispute resolution isn't international arbitration, but other things. Thank you. Thank you, Gary, for, for those introductory words, uh, which I believe give us the broader scope, really, of dispute, international dispute resolution uh, uh, as really the, uh, an issue that, that, that is, has much, much, more, uh, much more complex than uh, the arbitration uh, in, in, in particular. Um, I, 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 I wonder if, uh, if you have any views with respect to uh, the role of arbitral institutions in general uh, when, when it comes to tackle with, uh, with this specific uh, problem of uh, corruption in, in arbitration. That, that, that's a great question. It's also one I'm sure that both, both Professor Rogers and, and Jonathan would, would, would love to address. But from, from my perspective, um, both, both as, as counsel in, in numerous institutional arbitrations and, and seeing the workings of, of institutions and, and also in my role as, as president of, of the Court of Arbitration at the Singapore International Arbitration Center, which you, you kindly mentioned, um, arbitral institutions do have an important role to play uh, in not, not, just, not just ensuring that corruption does not taint or pervert the, the arbitral process, but ensuring that, that there's no perception of, of something like that occurring. I think that the, the, the right way to do it is what institutions thus far have been doing and importantly, what also they've been exploring in, in terms of future, future steps. What have institutions been doing? I think in general institutions have been, number one, requiring greater disclosure from potential prospective arbitrators and, and sitting arbitrators. Two, permitting challenges and equally important, um, publishing publicly their challenge decisions to ensure greater transparency. Three, working with institutions like arbitrator intelligence, I'll, I'll no doubt embarrass Professor Rogers, but, but she has, she's the founder of, of arbitrator intelligence, which provides um, data-driven reports. She'll describe it much better than I. And at SIC, we were, I think, the first institution to partner with arbitrator intelligence with a specific view towards getting feedback from parties about the arbitrators in our cases. And fourth, we at SIC have been working with the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators to develop a disciplinary mechanism for arbitrators. I, I can say that in a sense, Corruption has not been, thankfully, the principal focus of our efforts because in my tenure, five, five and a half years at SIC, we've had not a single complaint 
allegation, suggestion of corruption in any arbitration. We'll probably have close to a thousand cases filed this year. One never knows, but there's, there's been no hint of, of corruption. Nonetheless, we want to ensure that the requirements, both in the Unsatral Model Law and otherwise, of independence and impartiality of arbitrators, a, a, a bar which, if, if I can put it this way, is a lot higher than one for, for the simple lack of corruption, is, is fully complied with. And to that end, we require arbitrators to, to sign statements of, of compliance with our, our code of ethics and, and the like. Of course, if someone is truly criminal, these types of measures can be circumvented. Nonetheless, by selecting arbitrators carefully, by reviewing carefully parties' nominations of, of arbitrators before we confirm them, by allowing the parties to comment on prospective arbitrators and by applying international standards, the kind of transnational standards that you mentioned, Jose. I think we do a good job, at least so far as, as one can tell, in ensuring that neither corruption nor the suspicion of corruption is attached to SIC arbitrations. And I would underscore that, in my experience, that's true of our competitors. I have no particular interest in promoting the ICC, the LCIA, ICDR, or others. But in all my experience with all those institutions, there's never been an instance of corruption with any of their arbitrators. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gary, for, 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 the, for your remarks, uh, which are extremely important coming from, from, from you, uh, in, particularly with your experience uh, within an institution uh, uh, and also dealing with all the other institutions uh, as counsel or as arbitrators. Uh, I would like to, uh, to turn to, uh, to, to Catherine and Jonathan now for further uh, questions about uh, this particular issue. Uh, in the case of Catherine, um, I would probably add some extra, some extra um, important, relevant um, issues that should be in the, in the broader picture, right? Uh, as you know, Catherine, uh, I mean, of course, you are an expert on, on transparency issues. Uh, uh, there have been substantial efforts made in the last few years uh, to promote transparency in arbitration. Uh, perhaps, you know, we, should, we all know about this, uh, about, we'll, we'll remember Justice Brandeis, a famous, uh, famous uh, quote, uh, uh, that the sun, sunlight being the, the best disinfectant. Uh, but still, there is some, um, some questions, some issues that, that, that may probably tackled in a, in a, in a, in a different manner. Um, and I believe that your, your own experiences and your own recent writings uh, show uh, that we can do something or we can basically take another perspective to the same problem. So I wonder if you have any, any, any general thoughts on, on, on the issue, Catherine. Well, first, let me thank you um, uh, for having me. I'm also just absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, it's, uh, I also wanted to um, thank the students who have um, invited me and also published this remarkable edition, 500 pages. Very impressive. Uh, I wanted to say to the students who've been working so hard, because I know it is a huge labor, uh, that I think the single most important skill you can have uh, to be a successful lawyer is good writing skills. Um, and so the way I first started working very hard to develop my own writing skills was actually as an editor on Law Review. It really editing other people's work really hones you in uh, on nuances of good writing. And so, um, so I commend you on your publication uh, and also on the investment in yourselves that you've made in, in putting in the work to, to get it done. So uh, also, yes, I absolutely have things to say about transparency. 
Uh, interestingly enough, uh, uh, Gary's absolutely right that SEAC was the first institution with whom we signed a cooperation agreement, which means that SEAC at the end of each case sends out emails to the participants in the case, inviting them to complete our online confidential questionnaire, giving feedback about those arbitrators. As one example of the intersection of transparency and uh, anti-corruption efforts um, that we have heard from several arbitrators on an ad hoc basis, just anecdotal stories, um, that when they, that SIEC put into its statement of independence, uh, a, a, you know, a preview that they were going to send out this request for feedback at the end, and that arbitrators have voluntarily upon seeing that and signing a statement of independence that acknowledges they're going to be subject to feedback at the end, that they essentially uh, recognize and keep that sort of commitment to independence in the front of their minds instead of in the back of their minds while they are managing the case, making decisions. Uh, I think certainly the best thing for all of us uh, is if arbitrators are in so, sort of self-inspired to keep on their toes and put their best into uh, every arbitration. Uh, interestingly enough, and this is where the connection happens, the second institution with whom we signed a cooperation agreement is the Chamber of Commerce of Lima, who is also, or which is also incredibly committed uh, and innovative in uh, promoting transparency as a sort of natural or sort of organic uh, inherent solution to transparency. And in particular, they have done, I th they also, I think, mark uh, truly a global um, innovation uh, in their Alfaro uh, um, platform, I think is, might be what it's called. Uh, it is just a truly revolutionary level of transparency where they make available to public uh, information about their cases. And Peru has a very important relationship between corruption in the courts and arbitration uh, because the, the arbitration I think is oftentimes seen in Peru uh, and in various jurisdictions around the world uh, as an alternative to courts to avoid um, sometimes domestic corruption. Um, but in Peru, there's also a very special law um, that requires uh, that that uh, contracts involving uh, municipal or state entities, um, in fact, put in an arbitration clause in their contractual agreement, which means that all these cases involving state and local entities end up in arbitration, which raises the importance, of course, of making sure the arbitration is free of corruption, because now you don't just have an arbitration between two private parties, where justice is obviously important, but you also have a public entity involved in the arbitration, which means that the interests of the taxpayers, the interests of the citizens are also essentially at issue in the arbitration. Uh, and here again, I think not only, but in particular, the one I'm more familiar with is the Chamber of Commerce of Lima. Uh, one of the inspirations or, or special purposes for the Alfaro uh, was to be able to make sure that these arbitrations in which they are um, providing a very special institutional role in overseeing arbitrations involving states um, is clear to the public and to the citizens whose interests are essentially indirectly being resolved through these arbitrations. So I think corruption is uh, an incredibly important um, issue. Uh, it is one that I think actually is a natural uh, topic to discuss when we talk about international arbitration, not so much because it is a huge problem in international arbitration. I, I think if Gary hasn't come across an instance of corrupt arbitrators in his practice, it's hard to say it's a big problem. But I do think uh, it is an, an incredibly important one uh, for the overall perception of legitimacy of international arbitration. It's important. And I think it's also uh, an important part or maybe the absence of corruption is an important part of why so many people are drawn uh, to have a practice in international arbitration. And that is, they see an opportunity to build um, through international arbitration, a, uh, a regime for resolving commercial disputes, for resolving international disputes that transcends uh, those regimes that are otherwise available created by states. Um, and I think that call that we all seem to have that brings us to international arbitration is also what inspires us to make sure that it is a reliable, uh, corrupt, free, uh, a regime for resolving these disputes. The last uh, point I'll make about uh, uh, corruption and international arbitration is 
that I think there are two major responses uh, to corruption. One is regulation and the other is transparency. Uh, so Transparency International has seen as its primary activity uh, to try and sh shine light on corruption in hopes that it will shame people into uh, being less corrupt or shame, uh, uh, focus light on uh, corruption in an effort to kind of stamp it out. But it needs people to respond to that. And also Transparency International is a very kind of abstract investigation of, of, of anti-corruption. Uh, I think feedback about arbitrators, which is what arbitrator intelligence focuses on and the transparency that that provides, uh, ends up being a natural disinfectant against corruption as well. Uh, and in fact, transparency is one of our core values as an organization. Um, and in fact, I, as I said, I think anecdotally, we've already seen that we're making a difference. And we believe that uh, feedback voluntarily submitted um, by parties uh, about arbitrators on a confidential basis is one of the best ways to make sure uh, that arbitration is, doesn't end up being susceptible uh, to even uh, occasional cases of corruption that don't go unnoticed or um, without a remedy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Uh, this has been very interesting uh, and we'll probably go back to that. Uh, uh, we have uh, the privilege of having Jonathan who has been practicing uh, all around Latin America in the last, uh, I don't know if I have, if I'm allowed to say how many years, but uh, 25 maybe. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so Jenna, perhaps, uh, do you do you have any special uh, perspective for, from your experience in Latin America about uh, the two issues that we just discussed? You know, the, the arbitral uh, institutions and, and their role uh, within having. Uh, the best possible environment for an arbitration, and also with respect to uh, uh, arbitrators and knowing more about arbitrators and, and tools such as, uh, Gary mentioned, arbitrator intelligence in which um, Catherine is involved. Uh, do you have any, any, any thoughts as, as, a, as a practitioner with your, uh, with your special experience uh, in the region? Muchas gracias, eh, José Daniel. Muchas gracias todos los de, de Lima. Uh, thank you very much for the question. You know I have comments because, uh, as you know, uh, I usually have opinions about a lot of things. And so what I would like to do is take a few minutes and put the issue of uh, arbitrators, including the issue of corruption, in a historical perspective about how arbitration has evolved in the region over the past uh, quarter of a century. And as a starting point, I want to mention um, uh, law journals. I really congratulate the students of Damas for their work in organizing this event and also their publications. Uh, I, I have with me an article published in the Virginia Journal of International Law in 1990 by Jose Daniel Amado, first footnote, special thanks to Gary Bourne for reviewing his, his article. Um, and it was an article about recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments in Latin America. Because in 1990, of course, 30 years ago, Peru and Latin America were a very different place in terms of uh, attitudes towards uh, arbitration. I also have with me, all of these literally I have in my uh, library here in my house in Washington. I, I have uh, many issues of Demis, including one from 1992, a very critical year um, in, in Peru for many different reasons, confronting uh, hyperinflation, confronting terrorism, um, complete uh, changes in uh, the legal system in Peru and focus on um, investment. And this, this uh, issue, by the way, has articles by a lot of people that many of you would recognize, including Fernando Cantuarias, who I, who I see is attending today's uh, session. So what do these old law journals tell us? They tell us that 30 years ago, Peru and Latin America was a completely different place. And what happened in the 1990s, it's important to recall, um, really were a whole series of reforms and arbitration and that change in attitude toward arbitration 
uh, came out of a broader set of reforms and approaches to development, macroeconomic policy as well. And so when Peru first adopted a new arbitration law, advised by Horacio Grejera and Ion and others in the mid 90s, um, it was the start of a project which 25 years later um, has turned Peru into what I consider to be one of the uh, best environments for arbitration in the world. And so in, in the mid 90s, uh, when I had the opportunity to work with, uh, with Jose Amado and, uh, and others to get to know Manuel de la Puente y la Bel, and others in the Peruvian legal academic community at that time, arbitration was really a dream. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had a fellowship and wrote an article about arbitration as a component of legal and macroeconomic reforms in Peru. So you've got to keep in mind that in Latin America at that time, 25 uh, years ago, um, Latin America was just beginning to adopt in different countries new and more model, modern arbitration laws. Uh, the first uh, arbitration at the World Bank involving the Latin American state was 25 years ago. We, we handled it in Whiting Gates. And so you really had no mature environment for uh, developing arbitrators in the region. Then this real change in policy and building of the legal framework move to the next stage, which I'll call uh, building the platform. And in the next stage, what you saw was, first of all, um, inevitably uh, changes in uh, investment policy in different parts of the region and changes in attitudes of states. And it was very important in Peru that the Peruvian state in the 1990s adopted not only a very open view toward international arbitration for foreign investment, but also the use of arbitration domestically as well. And so this platform began to grow. Uh, lawyers, lawyers like Pepe and many others were in a way advising on uh, commercial matters and transactions and advising on the growing field of arbitration. And so this began to develop a new type of pool of arbitrators in the region both for commercial arbitration and in a different way for investment disputes. And it was in this environment that regional arbitration institutions uh, really exploded. Uh, 10 years ago, I published a, a survey. It was the first time that, that we had done a survey of all of the arbitration institutions in Latin America. We found over 160 arbitration institutions a decade ago in Latin America. Um, and I declared at that time that the era of Latin American arbitral institutions had arrived, but it was also with a note of caution because with growth comes significant uh, responsibility, the need to ensure uh, reliable rules. With the ICC, you know that if a comma is changed in the rules, there's a very long process involved before that comma is changed. And so it has been a challenge for arbitration institutions in the region uh, to, to ensure they have rules that can be counted on and then to build out through their growing caseloads the right kind of uh, pool of arbitrators to be available to decide cases. So in Lima today, for example, there's a very large pool of experienced uh, arbitrators involved not only in domestic arbitration, but in the increasing number of cross-border disputes that are handled through domestic arbitration. And I think that, you know, if in the 1990s, it was a time of policy change, new laws, uh, optimism, then this phase of building out the platform, uh, both through private practice, but also through the growth of institutions, um, a time of, of great opportunity, but also real challenges. And so where do we stand now, really about a quarter of a century after this sea change in the approach to arbitration in Peru and in Latin America? We see a very uh, mature field and a very large pool of arbitrators 
and inevitably with things that we need to uh, work on. We see that with arbitral institutions, in my view, what has emerged is really uh, around 10 or maybe a dozen truly regional arbitral institutions that have uh, an increasingly international footprint. In Peru, you have at least two uh, such institutions in AmCham and the Camara de Comercio, um, two very strong uh, institutions with um, not only very deeply established uh, procedures and approaches to appointing arbitrators, but also increasing international uh, presence. Um, but I think that inevitably these institutions have faced challenges over time. They face the challenge of ensuring that arbitrators have the right kind of training uh, some of us are engaged in a project right now exploring how to enhance arbitrator training uh, for Peru and for Latin America. They face the challenge of corruption issues. And obviously, Peru has been a place that's had a particular attention to issues of arbitrators and uh, corruption, a very complicated situation. But what we've seen is that uh, corruption in some ways was... Uh, an unresolved uh, uh, area from, from 25 years ago, from the era of liberalizing the economy, it's something that was never fully resolved in the way that the economies of the region have functioned. And that, and that challenge uh, impacts the field of arbitration, both in the merits and in terms of the challenges that arbitrators and arbitral institutions face. And finally, um, I think one other sort of macro challenge that impacts um, uh, the field and arbitrators in particular is that there was a really broad consensus uh, in the world 25 years ago about globalization, not in every country in Latin America, but surely one can say that whatever uh, drastic differences there have been with different governments over the years in Latin America and different personalities over the years, that there have been core concepts related to um, globalization that have held true. But we're in an era where the foundation uh, of globalization is uh, in dispute. It, here in 2020, a lot of things that we have taken for granted over the past quarter of a century and really since the end of the Cold War are in question. And that too could pose long-term uh, uh, issues for the field of arbitration, probably focused on investment arbitration uh, and where it goes from here. But meanwhile, I think that commercial arbitration and the institutions that have grown and flourished in Latin America uh, really are guiding the way in terms of having uh, more transparency, more diversity, broader participation of arbitrators and broader availability of arbitration to resolve commercial disputes, both in the private sector and uh, for state entities as well. And so to me, uh, in conclusion, when you look at uh, issues related to arbitrators in Latin America, you've really got to keep in mind this historical background. Uh, we've, we've gone from effectively not having a material pool of arbitrators uh, in Peru 25 years ago to now having a very large and, and diverse pool of arbitrators. And that means that they're facing bigger cases, um, complicated issues related to uh, conflicts of interest and things that maybe, you know, were, were historically treated a little more casually. Now they are really impactful. And so all of the great complexities that the most mature arbitral institutions face are issues that are being confronted now by Latin American arbitration institutions. And I think it's important to keep this uh, framework and, and this set of challenges in mind as we discuss arbitrators as well as corruption. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I've been told here that I need to approach the microphone. Apparently, I'm breaking up, so sorry about that. Uh, uh, well, now, this what, what you just said is extremely, extremely interesting, and, and, and it gives a very, very um, important perspective for all of us who practice uh, in this part of the world. Uh, 
uh, Jonathan, thank you. Um, now, turning to a, a different, but of course related issue, uh, uh, Catherine, uh, uh, in the last few uh, years, uh, another way to, to, in which the institutions have been dealing with, uh, with uh, uh, this issue, uh, these issues of uh, lack of integrity or, or, or difficulties, uh, uh, ethical difficulties, uh, uh, has been um, uh, by resorting to self-regulation, but also by uh, soft law. Uh, and of course, we have the IBA rules uh, that many institutions uh, utilize in their own uh, decision-making processes uh, when a challenge, for instance, comes up. Uh, but there is even more uh, concrete soft law right now uh, dealing with transparency. I wonder what uh, your views are on that, because I know very well that your experience is quite uh, vast on, on that issue. One of the things that's very interesting, I think, uh, I think was kind of presaged by uh, Jonathan's comments, is that the parties look to the arbitrary parties, everyone looks actually, including outside society, look to the arbitrators as the sort of guarantors of um, fairness, uh, justice. It's why we look at them for lack of corruption. We focus on them for uh, to find lack of corruption. And so what we're seeing, not surprisingly, arbitrators are the, the sort of lightning rod for concerns about arbitration. Uh, and to, particularly as there might be, uh, some people have expressed concerns about investment arbitration. Uh, we're seeing a lot of activity there to bring in more uh, and I think right now it's an open question whether it's soft law or hard law. There is a new uh, code uh, co-produced uh, by uh, Unstral Working Group 3 and ICSID. Uh, it's in draft form. Uh, I think we, we had a very lively, robust discussion uh, uh, in a program uh, last week or the week before. Um, you lose all track of time in this COVID environment, so it might have been a month ago, I'm not sure. Uh, but it is a, a very important code in the sense that it is uh, it raises a number of important issues. Uh, it raises a number of issues that are attempting to, a number of, of points attempting to respond to areas of concern. Uh, so-called double hatting, uh, repeat appointments, so-called issue conflicts. Um, these are incredibly elusive issues. Uh, for one, it's hard to even uh, agree on definitionally what we're talking about when we say something we all think we know the answer or the definition of, like double hatting. Um, even issue conflict, again, very elusive when you start saying, what, what do we really mean by issue conflict? Um, but in addition to this effort by Ansatral uh, and ICSID, there's also a new, very comprehensive, very thoughtful code that would definitely fall into the category of soft law by the Spanish club. Uh, that's again, a very thoughtful effort um, put in. Uh, in addition, you have lots of other areas of both soft law and hard law that overlap with these new sources of uh, soft law, which means I think one of the concerns that we are gonna have to face uh, quite immediately with arbitrary regulation is the fragmentation. Even if, as is, I think, proposed by the new Uncentral ICSID code, that this might be adopted through something like a Mauritius-type um, treaty and therefore become mandatory in, in um, even retroactively in investment arbitration, it doesn't mean it becomes the sole source uh, because, <clears throat> excuse me, I think the number of soft law instruments would still have a role to play. For investment arbitration that does not uh, go through ICSID, uh, you would still have national uh, interpretations of the New York Convention that are applied. Um, and of course, you have institutions that have their own definitions of impartiality and, and uh, independence that would be applied, uh, either in combination with or in tension with uh, the new uh, code if it's adopted. I will say that the, again, the code raises a number, the proposed code raises a number of very interesting issues uh, it's very, it's a very thoughtful effort, but I think it is very much seen as a first draft. Uh, I think there's more programming that'll be coming your way. So watch for additional programs to discuss the code. But I do know that both ICSID and Uncetral are hoping to get uh, comments uh, that are, I think the comment period is open through October 15th. So I'd very much encourage everyone uh, who's interested in that to kind of keep an eye on it. I think it's one of the most important things that's happening 
because even though it's only aimed at essentially so-called arbitrator ethics, it really is uh, an effort to um, introduce amendments through regulation of arbitrators um, that there is a wide variety of views on uh, in the in the region uh, in in the excuse me in this, in this field. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, uh, I uh, I will turn now to to, to Gary to see uh, if he has any any reactions to uh, to this very same question of um, soft law and its importance. Uh, you know very well uh, that uh, you know as I mentioned before the, the IBA uh, conflicts uh, rules have been uh, of significant importance in, in for Peruvian uh, standards, but also in most Latin American jurisdictions. Uh, is, do you think that, that that element, based upon your, your experience all, all around the world, is, is soft law uh, a, a way to, uh, to deal with um, impartiality, a lack of impartiality and lack of independence? Uh, is that the type of uh, elements uh, that that we, we should be looking for uh, when we deal with institutional arbitration? That's, that's a great question, Jose, and I, I agree with, with much, of, much of what Catherine, Catherine said. That not everybody does take the view that, that soft law is um, a constructive addition to international arbitration or anything else for that matter. Michael Schneider, who's probably one of the most experienced arbitration, international arbitration practitioners in the world, wrote a, wrote a piece in the, the Swiss Arbitration Association's law journal called Against Guidelines, um, in which he criticized not just the IBA guidelines, but also the IBA rules on the taking of evidence and the IBA guidelines on, on party representation. And he made some, I think, quite, quite thoughtful, thoughtful points. That said, I think the looked at more more broadly and and from a, a wider perspective, in a sense, what, what what is soft law really? Soft law really is just some lawyers like like all of us on on this webinar sitting around and talking about what we think good practice is and coming up trying to come up with linguistic formulations that capture our consensus. You can criticize the representativeness of the IBA Arbitration Committee, the participants on this webinar, the UNCITRAL Third Working Group, um, or any other self-appointed um, institution that seeks to draw up these guidelines. But as soft law, what they, what they really represent and where I think they do contribute something, they represent efforts to, to identify issues, to articulate concerns and to establish some guidelines. And that's why they're soft law, not hard law. And I think when they are seen as such by all the people that use them, that means arbitral institutions, that means counsel, that means arbitrators, and perhaps most importantly, that means national courts in recognition and enforcement decisions. I think soft law is a good thing, not a bad thing. I would contrast soft law instruments, particularly like the IBA rules on the taking of evidence, which consensually adopted by parties to regulate the arbitral process serve a very, very positive function. I would contrast those soft law mechanisms with some recent efforts at hard law. I, it's perhaps politically incorrect to say, and perhaps I shouldn't say it, but the Mauritius Transparency Convention is an example of hard law that has floundered, has failed. It has four contracting states and all the various states that participated in negotiating it and attempting to prescribe some hard law declined to then proceed to ratify what it was that they had so assiduously negotiated. And I think there's a, a lesson there, which is that the arbitral process is highly flexible. Soft law is suited to enhancing that flexibility and 
enabling it to work better. Hard law instruments like the Mauritius Convention, and I suspect the EU Investment Court that I mentioned previously, are likely ill-suited to that process. And I think we'll, in the long run, undermine it if they don't fail. But the good news is, of course, that they'll fail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gary. Uh, I uh, will now tur turn to, to Jonathan to see if he has any, any views on the soft law uh, in general, or perhaps uh, applying it to, to your, your own experience uh, in dealing with uh, the lack of impartiality and lack of independence. My prior comments started with some fundamentals, and those fundamentals go to um, the role that arbitration uh, plays in an economy and in a governing, uh, in a system of governance. And at the heart of that is the fundamental reality that arbitration is a creature of contract. Uh, and, and so in that context, keeping that cornerstone in mind, I think it's important to encourage projects that help to develop the field um, while also caution, cautioning against the risk of over-regulation of the field. Um, I believe that party autonomy is essential both as a matter of contract, but also as a matter of procedure and how you design cases and appoint arbitrators. Gary made a very uh, interesting point earlier in the discussion about uh, appointment of arbitrators in connection with the uh, European uh, uh, investment tribunal. And we've got to keep in mind that there's a reason that this is arbitration and not a court system, because inevitably when you push in the direction of too many rules, you run the risk of uh, creating a, a different set of problems. And so I fundamentally think that as a policy matter, as well as as an advocate, which is, which is you know, the principal thing that I do in my life, um, having the right balance, having the right uh, uh, autonomy for parties to craft the right kind of arbitration that functions for them is critically important. And so for arbitrators and for arbitral institutions, that means having just the right amount of rules, um, but not, not too much. I think that's fundamental to the health of the field and its capacity to continue to uh, grow and function as an alternative to court system. Thank you, thank you. And unless there, there's any, any, any further comment on that, uh, uh, we have, we have a, a couple of questions here from, from, from the audience. Uh, at least there's one that I think that uh, my Peruvian colleagues would like me to, uh, to, uh, uh, to mention to you and to see what your reaction is. Uh, it's here uh, uh, by, uh, in, the, in the chat that we have kept open. And basically, let, let, I could probably explain to you what, what is said here. Uh, what, what, it, what happened in Peru very recently is that we have had problems with respect to arbitration between uh, private parties and parties uh, uh, which are, you know, state, the state itself or state of agency or state-owned entities. The, the way this has been resolved is something that may probably, well, it's definitely the subject matter of that question, uh, because one way to resolve it uh, is that one way, the, the way that the, the state has resolved it uh, uh, very recently is by issuing a number of rules uh, that are not a special set of rules, but uh, instead they have amended the UNCTRAL model rule that we have to include special, uh, uh, a spe a special rules that would be really more uh, uh, the type of rule that you would, that you would find in, in a special statute on arbitration ar between private parties and state parties. And one of them is uh, that there is a, like a general disclosure of information. Uh, 
So basically, you have to sign every time that you become an arbitrator in a case between a private party and a state entity. You need to sign, you need to issue and, and file with the government uh, a very long um, declaration of, of of interest. It is not even a disclosure type of uh, uh, of of document. It, 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 there are questions that about you know your investments, your previous jobs, uh, things that that you would likely find in a in a in a public statement that you would require from somebody who will be about who is about to take a uh, a uh, a public office and not uh, not to become an arbitrator in a case between a private party and the, and and a state agency. So uh, I don't know if I if I if that was a, a bit confusing, but in any event, this type of uh, public documents that the, that, the, the, that the general arbitration law of Peru requires today, uh, it is intended, at least, you know, at least that's what, they, that's, that's what they said in Congress, that it is intended to be part of the remedies against potential issues of corruption in arbitration. Uh, and I wonder, you know, without you knowing the facts or the formats, uh, uh, whether you you think it's uh, it is another element that could be used. Uh, is it perhaps too much uh, of uh, regulation here? Perhaps uh, uh, if you, perhaps we're, we're talking about uh, a situation where uh, they they are making like an equivalence between an arbitrator and a public official, such as a judge. So uh, if, if, if you followed me, and, and I'm sorry, I, I just tried to, uh, to translate what, what is in that question. I wonder if, if any of you would have any, any comments, uh, Gary, Catherine, Jonathan? Sure, I, I'd be happy, and I'm sure both Jonathan and, and Catherine have, have more thoughtful observations, but, but let me go first um, with two, two brief brief comments. First, it's the topic is one of, of great importance. Arbitration between um, state entities and private parties is um, extremely important. It's more than 15% of um, the ICC's caseload. As states have entwined themselves with commercial activities over the past century, the response of both political and, and business communities has been to require the states to behave if they're going to engage in commerce, to behave and be bound by the rules that are applicable to commercial parties. Um, and for for much of the past century, those, those rules have, have worked well. I can't speak with respect to the specificities that, that gave rise to, to the Peruvian legislation, but it it is applicable in a field, arbitration involving state entities, that is supremely important. Um, another point of context, I promise two points, um, is, a, is a historical one picking up a bit on Jonathan's useful historical approach. Let me go back a little further in time. This isn't by any means the, the first effort by a government to regulate arbitrators and regulate arbitrators specifically in the context of arbitration involving state-owned entities. In Germany before World War II, arbitration was widespread. It was widely used as it was throughout Europe to resolve disputes between German state-owned entities and, and private, private businesses, private individuals. The National Socialists, the Nazis, came to power, of course, in the 1930s. And they too passed a special law dealing with, with arbitration. They passed the, the Reich's guidelines for um, arbitration, which required that arbitrators, not, not that they disclose material, but that all arbitrators be Aryans, i.e. not Jews, um, or, or other racially impure minorities. That was their way of regulating arbitrators in an effort to 
ensure that the state won rather than lost more arbitrations. I think when states put their thumb on the scale of justice, when they favor ultimately themselves, whether by regulating arbitrators or selecting who the arbitrators will be or otherwise interfering in the equal level playing field of choice between the parties, they do something that strikes at the heart of, of justice. I can't, of course, speak to the specificities of the Peruvian legislation, and I wouldn't presume to do so, but it is an area where there's a history, a, a pretty dark history. Thank you. Thank you. That's fascinating, uh, Gary. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, any reaction on, on the same issue, Catherine, Jonathan? I will just say one, I think, uh, uh, tangential uh, point, which is with regard to the market for arbitrators. We don't often talk about it as a market. I think, though, uh, actually Jonathan's comments earlier came, came sort of close, talking about the evolution uh, of, of the competition among institutions in Latin America, the rise of a, of a cadre of talented, um, increasingly globally known uh, Peruvian arbitrators. One of the things that's been fascinating to me working on arbitrator intelligence uh, is that even though we consider ourselves very much a global practice, and in many ways there are global ties among institutions, among professional groups, uh, that it's still incredibly regional in terms of knowledge of the arbitrator talent. Um, and I, and, and I, I will give a specific example uh, of this and probably make him blush. That's good. His uh, video is not on, but uh, one of our first sample reports, and we have videos on it on our website, is Fernando Cantuarius and also Roque Cavano, who was, who was mentioned earlier. And uh, when you speak to a Latin American audience, I mean, they almost stand to their feet starting to applaud when you say these names uh, because they're really the rock stars of Latin American arbitrators. But I promise you, I've given, uh, I've shown these sample reports in at least 40 uh, presentations in-house and public in North America. And apart from Miami, uh, no one has ever heard of them. And it was shocking to me that there was such a disconnect between the the truly elevated talent in Latin America and the understanding, including of some uh, practice areas that have represented, uh, you know, been active in arbitration in Latin America. And I know that's not Jonathan because he knows everyone and is well informed, um, but it was really striking to me that that there was this disconnect. So one of the things I think that um, is an area for improvement um, is actually in what I would call the globalization of the market for international arbitration, arbitrators. Uh, I think that that actually is a good thing for everyone. It increases competition. It creates a more robust meritocracy. Um, certainly, I would think, for example, if there's a dispute in Africa, uh, there's a lot of an, an analogies for uh, Latin America. You know, um, in foreign, you know, the foreign the tr uh, patterns of foreign investment, natural resources, whatnot. I could imagine well-known Latin American arbitrators being very attractive uh, in uh, African disputes and vice versa. But from what I can tell right now, from my research and my data, uh, they don't uh, interact, they don't intertwine, they don't cross-pollinate. Um, so I think in, instead of um, either hard or soft regulation, trying to uh, shape um, necessarily uh, patterns of, of conduct, that it can be really useful just to create the right incentive structures um, and to make the, the market itself work well. I don't, I don't believe in a completely free market. There clearly have to be some uh, boundaries and regulations to step in uh, when things go wrong. Uh, but I do think that that make correcting uh, market corrections could go a long way to helping some of the concerns that exist, including just having too small a pool of arbitrators so that we constantly see the same people uh, appointed over and over again. Uh, and I think that the, that shift to expanding the pool requires necessarily more information, which again ties back to transparency and uh, a more globalized cross-referencing uh, of information about arbitrators. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. That, that is really... That is really very, very interesting. Uh, a very interesting approach, uh, Jonathan. Any, 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 anything to say about uh, this specific question? I, I have a follow-up comments on both Gary and Catherine's observations. Um, in the first instance, with respect to 
state effectively a, a state role of oversight or intervention, you might say, with respect to arbitrators and disclosures. Um, it's important to keep in mind that there is a much longer history, despite all of the policy changes that, that made arbitration commonplace starting in the 1990s, there's a much longer history of state-oriented arbitration for Peru and, and, and the region. As a matter of fact, uh, I uh, had a case last year, I, I won a litigation uh, on behalf of the Peruvian state and the, the, the way that we won the litigation, um, which focused on bonds that were issued in 1875 in the context of the War of the Pacific and trade in Guano. And, uh, and, and the way it, cornerstone of how we won that case was to focus on a French language handwritten award I believe rendered in Geneva in 1901 that related to uh, debt and bonds uh, coming out of the um, War of the Pacific. Another great example, of course, is La Brea y Pariñas and the ad hoc arbitration a uh, uh, hundred years ago. And so now you see, and whether it's Peru, and I make no comment on any particular matter or client here, of course, but if a state has embraced arbitration, has embraced the use of arbitration um, uh, in connection with state contracts, which Peru most certainly has, has done, really has been a pioneer in that field. And then if there is a time of scandal or what some would perceive as a, a type of crisis, um, you know, a lack of uh, uh, self-regulation can be viewed as, you know, it, it's the way markets work. If there's a lack of self-regulation, you end up with a risk of uh, more regulation or even over-regulation. And, uh, and so whatever market you're talking about, I think that that is, uh, you know, this is a, a manifestation uh, of that inherent risk that if there is a perception that in this instance, the arbitration market, because it is a market, that there perhaps was a lack of uh, sufficient self-regulation um, that tends to lead to states intervening. Now, the other thing that I think um, is important is Catherine's comment about uh, arbitrators. Very interesting appointing arbitrators for Latin America, cross-border matters related to Latin America, um, because the pool is really quite mixed. So if I try to go and appoint an arbitrator in a domestic arbitration in Lima, the number of options is huge because there are a lot of people, a lot of lawyers, a lot of professors, people of different uh, uh, who've developed experience over the years that would be great picks. When you have a cross-border dispute involving a state or one or more multinational corporations, um, it, it, it's challenging. It's challenging. And really, you know, I'm fortunate in Whiting case that we, we uh, uh, have been pioneers in this field and we're willing and, and able to look at those kind of diverse appointments and, um, and build our practice accordingly and work with clients to help them uh, find a way to make uh, appointments that may not be as cookie cutter, I would say. But it is a challenge. And one of the things that I think that um, arbitration institutions, including in Lima, are trying to do and can continue to do more of is to play a role in the transparency about the pool of arbitrators and their background. We have a notable amount of information available about arbitrators who, for instance, sit in uh, exit cases, the most experienced arbitrators, but there's much less information <laughs> about people who are ex exceptionally experienced. And Catherine mentioned uh, Roque and Fernando, who are, who are excellent examples, certainly uh, even titans of the field, I would say. Um, and so I think arbitral institutions are very important because many appointments are not made by a Wilmer Hell or a Whiting case where we maybe have internal uh, resources that we built up over time to understand this diversity of arbitrators. And I would say that's where uh, 
not only uh, institutions come in, but also uh, institutes and universities. That's where Catherine comes in. That's where some of the work we're doing at the uh, International Arbitration Institute at the University of Miami, which I lead, comes in. And I think all of those efforts are, are very, very important to the long-term uh, diversity of pool of arbitrators and, uh, and, and also access to the right kind of information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, well, I'm being told that we're right, running out of time. It's, uh, it's, I have to uh, uh, thank you all for, for your, your patience and, and for your participation. It's been extremely, extremely uh, interesting for, for, for uh, the audience. Uh, uh, I will ask the, 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 the people at the editorial board at, of PEMIS to show up uh, now. Uh, because uh, it is time to uh, to say goodbye to this uh, to today's event, uh, and I don't want to. Uh, I, I'm not entitled to have that honor. I, all I, have, I want to say is thank you, Gary. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Jonathan. He has been ex of an excellent an excellent panel, uh, and, and 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 as we promised, uh, has been conversational, has been natural. We have dealt with a number of issues that I'm, I believe that people will be interested uh, to hear. Not only, not only uh, you know, people who are attending today, but who will be watching this in the future through uh, YouTube or, or other, uh, other, other um, uh, tools. Uh, so uh, the word goes now to, uh, to Lucia and, and the rest of the Temis uh, uh, editorial board. Joaquin, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you very much, professors Amado, Bourne, Rogers, and Mr. Hamilton for your interventions and valuable lessons about corruption and arbitration. Having said that, uh, we conclude the first date of the event. We would, like, we would like to invite all of our guests to join us tomorrow at 11 a.m. Lima time zone for the panel on corruption in investor state disputes which will be conducted in Spanish by our editorial coordinator, Mr. Martin Doe. Last but not least, we would like to remind that the 77 issue of Tammy's Law Review on arbitration is now available on pre-sale. Thank you all for your time, especially to our panelists. Uh, we're so grateful for your intervention as well as Mr. Amado.